Let me start by uh, making reference to what brought me here to Perth originally, which was a workshop that just concluded yesterday on um, biodiversity offsets. Um, and you see, ter uh, those of you who aren't familiar with, is anybody not familiar with what a biodiversity offset is? You sure? <laughs> Um, so here's a, here's, uh, a practice uh, involved uh, that's part of the, uh, of the biodiversity offset process. A developer wants to develop a piece of land at spatial location A. Uh, it will uh, plausibly have uh, harmful environmental impacts on sp X number of species in that location. And so... Uh, uh, there is an offset requirement, meaning that that developer needs to go to, say, different spatial location and ensure that, uh, uh, there, that between location A and location B, there's no net loss. In, uh, th that's one of, the, one of the principles, or one of the guiding principles would be no net loss in biodiversity, okay, by acquiring this, this offset. Uh, there's, there are different approaches to, to offsets. There would be, in addition to no net loss, there is what's called a net gain um, principle. So if you, the, you, you can't just make the world no worse off than it was before. You somehow have to make the world better off than it was before, okay? So, um, uh, uh, I offered a few provocative comments at the conference, but I didn't get around to the really provocative uh, uh, comment, so I'm now going to um, risk the ire of Katrina. Um, and, it, and it runs essentially as follows. This sort of, this no net loss approach to uh, biodiversity offsets sort of implies that all biodiversity is created equal. Uh, whereas I think from an economics perspective, we would say, heck, some biodiversity doesn't matter at all. So, so what's critical there, I think, if we're talking about, about no net loss, that we, that we qualify that term and we say no net loss in value. Okay, it's not necessarily critical that species A survives everywhere, okay, if nobody cares about species A, all right? So I think from an economic perspective, what, what matters are the values and not just the biodiversity per se, all right? That's a concept that you want to be really careful, I think, uh, pushing in front of non-economists a lot because they react to that. Um, but I think that that word values has to be part of the discussion. If you're talking about, okay, what works and what doesn't work, what are people going to find compelling in, as they attempt to regulate other people's lives. And I think it's those values that matter, not... So in that sense, economists are really quite different from ecologists in how we approach thinking about policy. Um, and uh, a lot of environmental values, in my experience... So I spent 11 and a half years working in a school of forestry and wildlife sciences, which is how... Ram and I um, ended up linking up. Uh, and a lot of environmental and economic, uh, ecological values are uh, derived from a functional context. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think about water, if you think about water quality, uh, then you will hear the following argument made, that trees are valuable in a watershed because that canopy coverage uh, breaks the fall of rain uh, as it's going down, and so when it impacts, and then it filters more gently down to the ground, where the ground then has uh, a greater temporal opportunity to absorb that rain without it flashing off of the land and creating havoc in the form of floods and then channeling and so forth. Uh, so uh, you will frequently hear 
of things like swamps being uh, regarded as uh, filters, okay? Uh, and so there's a sort of filtration function uh, that, that is uh, related to water quality. So, but these are functional values, and some of which we can, as economists, we can measure. So we can measure the economic cost of cleaning water and compare it to uh, differing amounts of cleanliness provided by differing configurations of green in natural contexts, uh, natural watersheds, okay? Where we're not very good, and this is why I've deliberately titled this paper an economist's lament, because I'm lamenting something here, what we're not very good at are getting our collective heads around assigning values, economic values, to non-functional um, ecological or environmental um, amenities, such as aesthetics uh, or cultural uh, amenity values. And so let me, and that's what I want to talk about here. And, and, and why is this important? It's important because coming back to this workshop on offsets, I think one of the things that you have to come to grips with, you know, there are two critical questions you have to come to grips with. Number one is, what's the economic case to be made for supporting offset, uh, an offset policy at all? Okay, and then secondly, if you have an offset policy, how on earth do you determine whether you're doing things correctly in some sense, right? That you're getting it right, whatever right means. Okay, to an economist, it's in terms of efficiency. Efficiency then means, okay, do you define efficiency in terms of no net loss, or you define efficiency in terms of no net loss of value? Okay, well, I think economists are naturally inclined to the latter, which is no net loss in value, and then, then you're squarely where I want, is my point of departure for this conversation, which is, okay, do we understand the values? And I think we don't. So let me start with a confession. That confession is, I like trees. This is our backyard of my house in Auburn, Alabama. I have about uh, two hect uh, a hectare lot, two acres. Um, that's literally looking out the back window of my sunroom, and it is all green, and this is like a wall of green. Uh, in the springtime, I have vines that grow up and flower. Uh, that's called Carolina jessamine, a yellow flower. I've got lots of wildlife uh, in my yard. So that's an eastern kingsnake baby from two years ago, scarlet kingsnake from this year, in my swimming pool. <laughs> Uh, you can't see this skink very well, but he's right up there. So we have a railroad tie rose bed, and he comes along every year in the springtime and services the female, and then he leaves. And, uh, but he's a really good-looking bloke about that big. For us in America, that's a big skink, and I understand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've got wildlife. So now... As it turns out, I'm not the only one in Auburn that likes trees. My neighbors like trees. Uh, they like two trees in particular. These two trees. This tree here and that tree there. Now these trees, these trees are known as tumor's oaks, and it's because um, this road running this way and this road running this way forms a junction which is known as Tumor's Corner, anchored by a store right over here selling lemonade, which is called Tumor's Drug Store, and this is like famous lemonade. We love our Tumor's Oaks. So what is this? Auburn University, where I taught for 18 years, uh, has a cultural tradition. After uh, big events in the history of the university, we celebrate these big events, particularly sporting events, uh, you know, like uh, football victories over the All Blacks. Um, we throw rolls of toilet tissue up into the oak trees. 
we really love our oak trees. Uh, I might, at some risk of overstatement, uh, suggest that this is really, truly a shared cultural phenomenon. All right, just sort of looking at the evidence here. Uh, approximately four years ago, uh, so uh, uh, Auburn University has a has a principal uh, a rival university, the University of Alabama. Both universities are public universities. They're both in the state of Alabama. Um, four years ago, a University of Alabama football supporter uh, came over to Auburn and poisoned our two trees. Yeah. Uh, so this set up a huge outcry. And um, this guy was absolutely vilified. Absolutely vilified. There was a huge outcry. But, but not only in Auburn, but also, you know, at the University of Alabama. And they hauled this guy in jail. They charged him with X number of crimes. Uh, it was really quite a big deal. So that's what happened. That's what our two trees look like after the poisoning. Now, the poisoning itself is not very highly relevant to what I want to say about these trees. What I'd like you to look, anybody here come from a, for, a specifically forestry background? Maxim and, and Ram, they, they, they'll know what I'm about to say. These two trees, pardon my language, are just crap. Okay, you can do nothing with these trees. There's, there's no timber in those, there's very little timber in those trees. Their shape is so bizarre, I mean, you can't do anything with them production-wise. You could chip them up, okay? So if I chip up these trees, how much am I selling those chips for, Maxime? Three dollars? Maybe? Okay, so if I try to put, let's call them functional, assign a functional value to these trees based on their, their use for uh, chipping and made, made, being made into paper products, or being made into furniture, or being cut up for firewood, the economic value I assign these trees is very, very low. Okay? Now I'll just remind you about something. Now that I've said the economic value based on function by any metric is going to be low. Okay? Now, let's just look at that. What does that tell you about the values that people put on those trees? Do you think it's very low? You think the right conclusion, the efficiency in terms of economics, in a f that, that a, if I placed a value of $50 on those trees, have I placed a very efficient value on those trees? And I'm, 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 the picture tells me otherwise. Okay, so I'm confronted now with data that, that, that makes me think that, that the reality is that the value of those trees is much higher than, than the functional value. Um, and the truth of the matter is, those trees were in bad health. We'd been killing those trees with love for years. You throw that toilet paper in those trees, you know how they remove that toilet paper? High pressure hoses. <laughs> you think that was good for forest health? <laughs> Are you kidding me? So we're killing these trees as it is, right? Nobody just wants to admit the truth to themselves. So along comes this very convenient guy from the University of Alabama. He does the job quickly rather than slowly. And he's the bad guy, right? But we were really sort of killing these trees anyway. But as it turns out, um, these trees really have immense value. And so occasionally, we get natural experiments that give us glimpses into these values. They don't come along very often, uh, but they, in my opinion, they upset our sense that we really know what we're talking about as economists, okay? It turned out that, that hundreds of thousands of dollars were raised and spent to try to save these trees. With, by treating, you know, the soil. They dug up all the soil, they flushed it out, they put new soil in. Uh, all, it all was worthless. These, once these trees were poisoned, the, the, uh, my, my colleagues in the School of Forestry said, won't matter what they do, those trees are gone. 
Okay? And yet, they spent literally hundreds of thousands of dollars on those trees. And they raised that money. I mean, suddenly, people were just mailing money in to save the tree fund. Um, yeah. You do, so, so the first time, you know, Ram said, uh, why don't you come and, you know, not only attend the workshop, but why don't you give a presentation? So I, 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 and I thought, okay, what am I going to talk about? I, I decided this is what I was going to talk. So I did a Google search, and 149,000 news items on the Tumors Oaks. They planted two new trees in February of this year, um, and... Here is a quote from one of the Auburn University students, but I think it's very representative, even though it's a sample of one, for those of you who we just got out of talking with each other. I do think it's representative. This is very representative of how people feel about these trees. Um, and it's very different from, the value here is very different than the value that we typically talk about, it is a shared cultural value. It is not a functional value. And we just have a... It, I'll have more to say about that in a minute. Um, as it turns out, it's not just the people in Auburn, Alabama who like trees. People from everywhere around the world like trees. And certain trees have a special appeal to people. Uh, and with all due respect to uh, eucalyptus regnans, regnans, I've been there. I have an appreciation. You guys are just out of your league. <laughs> okay. The giant sequoias and giant redwoods in California have just, yeah, I mean, where else can you repel off of trees? These trees are, you just cannot imagine, short of being, I, this photographs like this do not do justice to these trees. They are just simply overwhelming. Um, that's a, that was literally used as a dance hall, historically. Uh, they are fire resistant, gorgeous orange bark, um, and they're immense. And can you drive a car through? Well, of course you can. You can drive through that one, or that one, or that one. Sometimes you could drive a bus through. Um, but the trees are not unique to humans and appreciation of trees. Uh, many trees are special. Forgive me if I don't recognize them all. But these are famous uh, cypresses uh, off of the Monterey Coast uh, in California that are world famous. These are f photographed. You can see, I mean, I got the images off the internet because they're so famous. The images are there. Uh, but just a spectrum of different kinds of trees. Okay. A cactus isn't a tree. I get that. But there's a huge amount of value, both monetary and cultural value, on those cacti in, in the Southwest. Uh, there are. If we could only say the same thing about the plants in the middle of Australia. Uh, and it's not just trees. So we see other uh, aspects of nature that, that are valuable to us. Uh, we, see, we have glaciers, we have oceans and sunsets, we have different natural formations. Uh, in a whole wide variety of uh, settings. Um, so I've just, I've talked a little bit about why that's so. Where, what are these values? Well, these values are aesthetics. Aesthetic, there are two really quite different kinds of values here. Non-functional values. Some of these values uh, are highly individualistic, highly personal. You know, it's hard for me to describe to you how the value I attach to nature is just completely personal. Um, and 
uh, some of these values, uh, I haven't said it here, but some of those values are shared cultural values. That's the tumor's tree deal, right? That, that, that your value is somehow a function of the fact that other people share the same value with you, okay? And here is the lament. Mostly those values are hidden from us. Uh, unlike those, those um, functional values, uh, these, these spiritual values, these aesthetic values, these cultural values are hidden. And as I say, on rare occasions, something happens that makes you aware of them, like this Tumor's Oak tragedy. Uh, there was an equivalent um, incident, actually, uh, with a tree in Texas, a very famous, it's called a treaty tree in Texas, where a treaty... Um, I think between the Spanish uh, or the Mexicans and the Americans was signed, uh, called the Treaty Oak, where it got uh, damaged and created enormous outcry. But we just, we don't see them very much. So my question, in effect, or my lament is uh, that how do we deal with them? How do I, I, know, I, I periodically, the, somebody lifts up the shade and I think to myself, wow, there's a lot of value there. So I think to myself, I walk into a conference on, on, on biodiversity offsets, and I think, we've got a lot of this wrong. We, we don't even have a clue about what the values really are to be talking uh, with any real degree of, of being informed at a conference like that. And that's squarely, it seems to me, on us, on, on economists maybe working with non-economists, but, I mean, we're the ones that claim to understand values and how to measure them, and yet I don't think we do a very good job here. I'm convinced we don't do a very good job here. And I'm a real market-oriented economist. I think we can attach value, values to stuff. And here's one of those places where I just don't think we do a very good job. Um, and I... Uh, you know, I'm quite aware of the literature where we try to, you know, measure values through willingness to pay models and things like that. Uh, and I, I just don't believe it. I think the willingness to pay models tell us some things. Uh, I think travel costs tell us some things. Uh, but I would just, I would, I would, you know, go, I'd remind you to go back to that, that picture with 100,000 people there. They're telling you something about values that I don't think shows up here very well at all. A contingent evaluation study? Or as a choice experiment, one of the two. A study of preference. Uh... I think a, a stated preference relative to what? How would you design the experiment? How, what would be the counterfactual? The hypothetical could be that some idiot from the neighboring university comes in and poisons this tree. How much would you be prepared to pay to prevent that? You could. Let me turn the question back around on you, Dave, and say, how much confidence do you think you would have in the result? Looking at the size of that crowd there, how much confidence would oh, you have? I wouldn't have any confidence very much in surveys about anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Particularly, so, so I agree. So in principle, again, coming back to the fact that there are two, two types of these, let me call them non-functional values, okay? Encompassing aesthetic, cultural, et cetera, et cetera, spiritual values. There are two types, one that are intensely personal, one that are shared cultural. I, I would be much more sanguine about your ability to maybe get some useful information on those personal values, less sanguine about those shared cultural values. Just to be something for the, de for the, you know, for the debate afterwards, but you know, with Dave's questions, the, the question I suppose is that you're asking people to value something that they don't have an experience with. And I would say that from what you've shown us, the context um, is very important for how the thing happens. 
So you would have to, um, I don't know, a vignette kind of, uh, a vignette kind of um, uh, methodology that's being used by psychologists to create a very specific, vivid scenario I mean, with a picture for a picture. Uh, to get people to react to that. Um, otherwise, you know, it's an experience they haven't had, presumably. Uh, so it's hard to value something that you haven't, don't have experience with. And yet this one would say it would be an easier case, like if you're getting them to value the two trees which are the local icons in the town, yeah. at least they've got an idea of what they're valuing and they've had experience in direct interaction with them. When you're getting people to value environmental goods which they've never personally interacted with, I think it becomes a much more difficult, much more abstract concept, much more difficult to tie down. Let me, so yeah, I mean, I think you're asking a, a really good question here. Uh, so, you know, bear, coming back to the Tumor's Oak example, where we know what the facts are. The facts are that, you know, something on the order of half a million dollars got raised, but much more than that got spent to try to save those trees. Uh, you know, if I sit here and, and run a men um, the mental, you know, experiment through my own head, where I say, suppose I just sent a survey out to, you know, 300 members of the Auburn community, however you wanted to define that, and said, uh, um, you know, we're conducting a survey on uh, tree security. Okay, security is all the rage now, national security. In Auburn's case, the trees are national security. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would you pay to prevent the trees being killed by snipers? Okay, or, or a terrorist. That's right. I mean, this guy was really li labeled a terrorist. And, uh, uh, and if I tried to aggregate that, you know, by, by whatever, you know, uh, I just can't comprehend that I'd get numbers anywhere close to what I actually observed. So that's a judgment. I'm just mm -hmm. judge people. Yeah. I don't know. So, so I'm not, let me put it this way. I'm not confident that, that, we, that we would come close to what I saw uh, there. So, I mean, it's, it's one issue here that the values that people place on it depend upon whether the tree was poisoned or whether it died of old age. Oh. It's really you know, so so um, I think part of the value and was the outrage. <laughs> Donations was an expression of outrage at what had happened, but so how do you put a value on the it's, it's a question of being asked. Well, let's you know, how much are you prepared to pay to extend the life of the oak for ten years beyond what we expect now? Then that that might have had a very much lower value because those oaks are going to die anyway. So yeah. <laughs> Again, I think Ben's observation is is just dead on target. I think how how the question is framed is just extraordinarily important because even tiny little changes in the context might have very large changes in what people are reporting back to you. You know, is it, are they reacting to like the feeling like their lives have been violated because their trees, their trees got attacked? Uh, or is it, which is sort of a very intrusive, aggressive way of framing the issue? Or are you asking them to react to something much more benign, which is, you know, just uh, your trees are getting old, you know, if we could extend their lives another five years, you know, even though, you know, we're going to have to put, you know, bed pants on them because they're getting so old and can't control their own functioning any longer. How do you feel about that? Are you willing to pay for, to let us do that? Okay. But how you frame this is very important, right? No question. But, I mean, that's a bigger lesson for all of this literature. Which we do. Yeah. So, um, when people come out in such big numbers and they are reacting and so on, I think just it's easier to think of the, the early controversy about non market valuation, you know, the warm growth effects and so on. Uh, it, you, you are looking at many things. It's not what they value in terms of the trees, being there and so on, but there is also something else going on when people come out and they are showing some kind of solidarity and so on. So it's not just about the trees. Uh, it's not, but the trees end up being, I think, a critical uh, catalyst. They are heads with the other Yeah. 
so okay. So, so seeing how other people react, I guess. Um, yeah, I agree. I think there are important contextual challenges to to this. I agree. But you've got two kinds of data there, which may be telling us different things. One is the number of people that you show us in the picture, and the other thing is the amount of money that was, on the one hand, uh, to willingness to pay that people actually actually sent, and, and the amount that was actually spent. Right. So this is, in fact, it's three kinds three, of data, right. which might actually lead to three separate um, analyses, if you want, and see what they tell us. Right. Right. Okay, so part of my response to that observation, again, which I completely agree with, would be to say, no matter which of those three you pick, that it doesn't matter to me, if you compare any of those three to an assessment of value based on function for those trees, it's just hugely different, okay? So that by, by ignoring aesthetic values, aesthetic, spiritual, cultural aspects of uh, environmental services in our calculation of values, I think we're missing something uh, potentially very, very important that, that is easy to dismiss because we don't get a chance to see it very often, okay? But I guess, you know, I'm now saying, I'm very evidence-driven. So I've seen this firsthand. I do think that occasionally we have opportunities to see that these values are there but they tend to not show up, make themselves uh, very obvious very frequently at all. And so we tend to ignore them. And so the economist in me says, mm, I'm not entirely happy about that. I think maybe ignoring those values it leads to uh, uh, inefficient decision making. So the guy should not have been jailed. He should have been given a medal. Hundred thousand dollars in uh, in, um, in uh, reward because he killed two trees, but he he highlighted a problem that might actually affect thousands of other trees. So he did a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so so I would respectfully suggest an, an experiment. Maybe it was an unintended experiment. We, it was an experiment. we could. I might be willing to pay your transportation costs to Auburn. And let you make that make that statement in public, and 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 observe the result. Why be given bulletproof protection? Uh, okay, I have, I, again, I think your comment is very, very well taken. Um, and yet, let me offer a response. It's a response given to me by uh, one of my colleagues who's, in a, who's a very, very good economist. Um, and it refers, so and it's entirely about context, okay? <coughs> and about about this question of does it matter how the trees got killed. I'm going to give it to you in a slightly different context. In America now we have got 
we can charge somebody not only with a crime against somebody else, but we can charge somebody with a hate crime against somebody else. And a hate crime, so, so there would be a distinction between you killing somebody um, and you killing them because of their skin color or because of their sexual orientation or their gender or whatever, okay? And these hate crimes are regarded as being particularly more objectionable than regular crimes. And my colleague, who as I say is a very, very fine economist, says, are you kidding me? Does it really matter? Dead is dead. Okay? So in that sense, does it really matter? Now, so back to the tumor's oak, do you think, do you think it really mattered to people how these trees got killed? And your answer is, yeah, I think. I think a lot of people were shaking their heads like this. They're saying, my colleague is wrong. Dead isn't just dead. Okay, the how is important. And, yeah, again, I, I'm smart enough to see all the heads shaking less than them. And, and so the empirical evidence suggests to me as a scientist, yeah, it matters. And, and that means we need to be very careful about how we... Again, it's a question of, are we getting these values right, right, whatever that means, okay? Are we doing any kind of credible job of, of presenting a set of data about value, environmental values or any other kinds of values that, that, are pl that ought to be, you know, plausibly the basis for making decisions, public policy decisions? You have referred several times about this right. But is there anything like a right value anywhere? Uh -huh. Okay, so I was wondering to this follows up with this in Yeah. Um, sort of pretty general debate here. Uh, and you can open it up to market values as well as prices, right? And, and so your question is, is there anything like a true value of something? Depends how you define that, of course. Uh, if you define a true value forever, Thing most people say no, there's no such thing, but there could be a true value now, today, in this context, uh, a context-dependent true value. The difference with the market, the market price is that okay, it measures it for us in a way, uh, rather than we having to go and roll up our sleeves and measure it. But market prices change as well, so um, there's no real difference between a market price or something like that. Uh, different years, different circumstances. You know, all you need is a, a journal, uh, sorry, a, a newspaper thing about the consequence of having this medication, and all of a sudden the price of medication in the uh, in the drugstore just collapses or goes through the roof. So same thing. Uh, yeah. Welcome to the world of state continent But even even market prices. Even market prices only rep only reflect minimal values, right? They ref they don't reflect they don't reflect willingness to pay. They reflect what you can get away with paying, because someone's willing to sell it to you that cheaply. Oh yeah, yeah. I would say that. Okay. You get the same issue. But the same issue of volatility, yeah, oh, temporal, temporal, temporal change. What's the true value of something? Right. Probably right. Probably most economists would say, well, there's no such thing. Because you're still, I still be willing to pay more, but I'm rather on a rainy day than I would be on a sunny day. Well, you know, I, again, even at, even at an individual level, the the value I would place on seeing a rainbow, for example, might be very different today than it is tomorrow. Just because today I'm feeling kind of down, a little depressed, I've got to come address an audience in Perth, Australia. I mean, just, I mean, life's looking kind of grim. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I see, a, I see a rainbow and suddenly I'm like, wow, this is cool. And tomorrow I'm already feeling happy. I see, uh, you know, sort of an equivalent rainbow and it doesn't affect me very much. So, again, I, I, I agree with all of the comments. I think they're good. Um, and, and yet, so I, and I'm, a, I'm just like a super avowed free market economist. So I like market prices. I think they're very, very important in the world. And yet, um, I think we're missing something. I, and, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm sort of, one of the things that I don't like to do as a scientist is just sort of dump a problem in everybody's lap. Yeah. But this is one of those ones where I don't have an answer. I don't have, but I'm, I'm at this, 
I'm at the thinking stage. I'd like to understand the, the f complexity of what I'm dealing with and then see whether I can tackle it. I don't have an answer here. I don't know how to assign those values. Uh, I do think those values are real, I do th and I do think they are, but I do think they're highly changeable over time. So, so is there what we might call a spot market in those values? I think they are, and the spot market may be very, very volatile. So what, what we are saying is actually true value, but that could be partial. Like, but it's still what we are saying is that there's the value, in, given the context, given the time, and everything. No doubt. I, I think no doubt at all. And moreover, we, you know, we know that there are market substitutes here, uh, even for nature. Okay, so part of what I like about, you know, my backyard with all those trees back there is that uh, I can hear the wind blowing in the trees. Okay, well, we know we can buy, buy CDs that are nature sounds. Okay, the surf pounding, wind blowing in the trees. We can, so there are substitutes in, in our language, right? Um, we can buy photographs. If I really wanted to, I could put um, uh, big, big coverings on my windows of nature scenes. So I could look at nature scenes. All, and not only that, but I could, I could make them movable, right? So I could just like a whole, whole all the, the pictures keep changing. Okay, so I don't have to look at just one. Now, so I could do that. Technologically, I could do that. And I don't. I look at those trees. Okay, so that tells me something. That tells me I, the value I place on, that, on those trees is higher than the substitutes I could buy. Right? So I've got some idea there of values. Even still, I just, I'm concerned that I just I don't understand this very well. Dave? So, so I'm, not, I'm not by any means an unmarked valuation expert. And there's a bunch of people in the school who are, and they're not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of them are not around here. But, um, uh, but I, do, I, I do feel the need to be a bit of a devil's advocate because I, I, I feel like, okay, yeah, sure. A, 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 a revealed, a, sorry, a stated preference uh, study of some sort is a large confidence interval around what that's giving you. And that's always true. But there's large confidence intervals about pretty much everything we do in economics. Um, perhaps they're a bit larger than that. But, but I don't think you've, created a, you've provided a convincing case that it wouldn't be captured in within a with a state of preference. If I did a, if I did a, a good, well-designed state of preference study in Alwyn, right in the, at the height of the controversy, I reckon it would give me some, uh, some numbers that would be within Cooey, a pretty reasonable indication of, you know, of the value that you're saying you're worried that we're missing. I think, I don't, no, no, totally convince me that we're really missing it, or that we need to miss it if we use all our skills and, and apply it at the right time and the right way. I think that's a key, that's a key thing, though, is that, uh, is that the difficulty of, of applying it at the right time. And, uh, and that's, uh, I think that's the tricky bit. Yeah, but, but the time it has to also be in the focus. Yeah. Okay, so let me s give a partial answer or response with the numbers here. So, um, again, sort of doing a Google search, uh, on forest products, forest planning, forest functions. So these are sort of functional aspects of forests. You can see there's been a lot of attention paid relative to, if you look at these two here, uh, forest aesthetics, forest aesthetic values, not, we just don't seem to be paying much attention to that. Um, We're paying, paying, not paying much attention, I agree, but that's different to we don't have the capability, which is what you seem to be saying before. I agree. Uh, it's no question. That's not... I, but I don't know. I don't, does, it, does, it, does it really mean that it's just of no interest, that in fact those values are so low that we just don't care about them very much, so we don't do much research on them? Uh, does it mean that we're not confident in our ability to measure them accurately? I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I'd be inclined to say we over-research it. The, 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 in terms of the, 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 the marginal value of, the, of environmental economics research across the world, I, 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 the allocation <laughs> of research across all the different topics, all the different ways we could spend our time, and you look at the proportion of that effort that's allocated to, to non-market valuation, I think we probably do more than this. Uh, okay, let me refine that a little bit. 
I want to refine it around that word right there, okay? I would argue, although I don't have a, um, I don't have the data to support what I'm about to say, so I'm going to make it as a conjecture. I would conjecture that aesthetic values are very, very important in the aggregate across time, uh, and we're not paying as much attention to them as we should be. A completely normative statement, and you and I may agree to disagree about that, but I think, I, put it this way, I'm, again, I'm, I tend to be data-driven. I think I've ignored aesthetic values much of my life, professional life, but I think I'm now becoming convinced that, that's right, I'm a, re, I'm a reformed smoker. Uh, I think I'm becoming convinced that they are more important than I've previously given them credit for being. Um, and that if, if what I'm saying is correct, and as I say, I, don't, I can't make a strong empirical case for that yet, uh, it would have, I think, profound implications, policy implications. I would like to add something here that hasn't been mentioned yet, but I was thinking of from the beginning. You said one word when you were presenting that case. You said shared cultural values. Now here in Australia particularly, uh, there's been a number of, of important cases of the papers where you had um, Aboriginal Australians um, putting very high value, lovely cultural values, um, on things and in the non-Aboriginal putting other kind of values, you know, um, market values or functional values, if you call it. And I suppose that the, um, what you're talking about could have impacts on how uh, you analyze conflicting, so non-shared cultural values. So I don't know, maybe for, if you take the trees, they have very high value for, you know, half the city and uh, will have to be something else, as opposed to linked to a war or something. Uh, so the winner's side would, you know, would value very highly the symbol. The losing side would value very negatively. Um, so, okay, so you've got something there. Um, I guess my question is, how would that contribute? So here, what I'm doing, I'm getting outside the initial assumption of shared cultural values. So now we're into the non-shared cultural values, you know, between uh, two different communities, say. And what happens? You've got to say an object, though. Yeah. So let's say one, one half of them want to pull it down, and the other half wants to spend a lot of money maintaining it. Yeah, so we've got a, a really good example of that in America now. It's called the Confederate flag, mm -hmm. uh, where you know some people view it with reverence, and other people view it with scorn, hatred. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, again, good point that I don't have an answer for. Of course, I, so we're thinking about. It's not academic. It has an impact in the sense that it does have impact on lots of dollars being spent for or against, and has an impact in terms of social conflict. Yeah, and how you frame, you know, a a an instrument that attempts to monetize uh, that strikes me as being challenging. Because it's multidimensional, I think. Mm -hmm. yep. um, uh, also, we talk a lot about the willingness to pay, but ability to pay is also important. And in the case of <coughs> a particular group valuing something very highly, the customer that willingness to pay will have much to spend. And so if the ability to pay is also very um, different, um, or di different across different sectors of the economy, that might also skew your results in the uh, long opportunity. I agree. I, you know, I don't know what else I can say but to say I agree. I mean, that's been a, that's been a problem all along. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, in our, in, in our context, you know, the strong likelihood would be that um, in the Deep South, in, as a rough generalization, it would be blacks that would be in a lower socioeconomic status and less able to reflect monetarily their response to the Confederate flag, right? And whites would be, who are, again, generally speaking, better off economically, 
would have a greater ability to express those preferences or those values monetarily. And yet, do you really think that, does that mean that, you know, the one group really feels more, the place is more value, positive value than, than the negative values? Is, the answer is, mm, I feel a little uneasy making that conclusion, right? Yeah. Mm, yeah, I would take issue with that. So the, I would take a particular issue with the word fair because I have, I never let my daughters use that word in our household growing up um, because unless somebody can tell me what that word means and we have a shared understanding of what that word means, I don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. Um, but I, I agree with you in the sense that, again, you know, I hope you understand, I am really a strong free market economist. I believe in prices. I believe in market prices and what they, the information they convey. Uh, and yet, I understand this ability to pay limitation of the argument, okay? What else, what else do we have, though, okay, that gives us, you know, any information that's useful? About, are we going to rely on surveys? Uh, which we know are subject to flaws, or are we going to rely on market prices, which we know are also may not be perfect? We know in particular all they tell us is what they, somebody had to pay for an item. They don't tell us how much they may really value the item. Okay, um, so we know they're not a complete represent a, an accurate representation of of the value of an item to somebody. Okay, but I can tell you, I'm not about to pay any more for an item than I have to. Uh, and yet I may value it much more than I actually have to pay for it. And I, and I think we all basically behave the same way in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that really makes consumer surplus. We, we estimate the markets and get the difference between willingness and willingness to pay an actual price. Right. We can, I mean, that works for, for items that are traded. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't work, obviously, for items that aren't traded like aesthetic values. I mean, there's some trading of aesthetic values, right? We can, we can buy artwork and we can buy... Yeah. Um, I, I think there is not a lot more here. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really my bottom line. I, I, it's a lament. Uh, okay, Dave is, I haven't convinced Dave yet, yet. Um, well, why don't we try? I mean, you know, we could try. Um, I make an analogy with, um, you know, doing surveys and first moment surveys and doing economic experiments, uh, real experiments in the lab. And I remember attending a workshop with uh, Vernon Smith was the initiator, and there was the Ministry of the Minister of Fisheries of Denmark or Norway who was there, and he said, "Well, you can't um, study in the lab macroeconomic issues." I think there was one example: you can't do macroeconomics in the lab. And there's two answers by that was happening in 2004, and Vernon Smith. Had had two answers. He said, well, well, you haven't read my paper in 1962. <laughs> and all the other papers are written since on macroeconomics in the lab. And secondly, he said, in 40 years of experimenting, I haven't been able to think of a single problem in economics that with a bit of imagination and cleverness, you can't actually design an experiment for. That was a really, really thing that really struck me. But I'm saying it probably is true to some extent as well with 
um, you know, survey-based methodologies. And that is what we are interested in, and that's what we want. We just have to imagine, you know, work on imagination and say, okay, we want that, we want to uh, elicit that kind of information. Well, let's work on it and see how we can do it. Right. Maybe right. it means tweaking or adding something to a standard uh, non-market evaluation. I don't know, I haven't thought about it. Um, but I would sort of agree with Dave. This is, I don't see any, any fundamental um, obstacle, I think. Okay, but, but here's here's the issue to, to bring it back to biodiversity offsets. Is that sure we can you know we can develop the the experiments to do this whether it's in a lab or whether it's collecting the data and using contingent valuation. But the the data is not the data available is not uh, widespread enough. It's not always a, a usable enough scale um, for these things to be applicable on a on a frequent basis for you know for when it comes to doing things like biodiversity offsets, um, the the level of effort to, to go into something like this, I mean from from my experience with, with environmental consulting in the U.S. is you know when you've got a, when you have a, a six month time frame for an environmental document, that's not enough time to to get those values. It took 120 years. That's, that's all to get a monitor still reliable. Sorry, that's all time we have for today. And I guess we could. Yeah, we, we can continue discussing. Yeah. We can, yeah. yeah. We can I'd like to, if I can, sort of petition for last comment before we break. Because okay. I am struck here by this, by this line of discussion. Uh, we can think in terms of some kind of hedonic analysis. Just take one, which Dave mentioned. And think in terms of uh, look at looking at prices of homes in different locations of the world, with d and we can control for all of the characteristics of those houses. Uh, we can control for size of lot. We can control for number of trees. We can control maybe even for spatial location and height of trees. We can control for the spectrum of color around that. We can control for sunset views and things like that. And we could we could do it. We could do quite a complicated, complex, hedonic analysis and draw some conclusions, maybe, all right? And yet I would still worry, I think this, I think my worry may actually come closer to Inga, Inga's comment that, that all those, that market prices may not be very good, may not be very, very satisfying. Because again, back to my comment, I'm only paying what I have to pay for that house. And that interacts with what everybody else is willing to pay for houses in that same neighborhood. Okay, I understand that. But I'm only paying what I have to. And yet I may value that sunset view much more than what I paid for that house. And I think that's what bothers me a little bit, is that what, I, what I'm increasingly thinking of as a disconnect between, between market prices and values. And I may, I may not have, ha have compellingly convinced you know, everybody here to share that concern. Um, but, I mean, again, I would just say, I'm, man, I'm a lifelong strong advocate of market prices. And I'm suddenly, I mean, it's like, it's the, it's the, 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 uh, that's right. It's that, it's that uh, smoker who's found Jesus thing. Um, <laughs> you know, am I suddenly realizing, you know, the error of my ways? I don't know. Intriguing problem from my perspective. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, I'd be, thank you very much.